Okay, so, so that's the first thing. So we can clear all this out. Now, once again, we have exactly as many um, as many zero modes as integral, so we get something non-zero. But from each of the brackets, we have to choose a different zero mode section. Right? Because you have to have the only way to get something non-zero is having one product of each zero. Is that clear? Right, if you choose, well, it's even simpler. If you chose the same zero mode insertion twice, that term's just zero. It's that simple. Okay? Because the graph nature of the variance. So the only way you get something non zero is to choose a different zero mode. But you can choose this play involved. You could choose the ever zero mode from here, the nth one from there, and so on. There are many possible ways in which you can do this choosing. Each possible way will give you an answer. Now, uh, uh, there's a leap of imagination I want you to take. Uh, you can check this for 2 cross 2. Huh? Can, can somebody guess what the answer to this? What the answer to this part of the name is? So suppose we chose the first zero mode from here, the second one from here, the third one from here, the fourth one from here. What would we get? We get the product of all these factors, where this one was replaced by B01, this one was replaced. So we would get a factor like B0, B01, del 1G, times B02, del 2G, and so on. But now suppose we chose instead the second zero mode from here, the first zero mode from here and everything else the same. Then what will we get? We get B02 del 1G, B01 del 2G times the same stuff from here. But we'll also get a minus sign. Because we've done the integral of things in different orders. And so on. We get many such terms. So now, can somebody guess what you're going to get here? Actually, if there are only two insertions, this is the full answer. What is this? Say it, say it loudly. Determinant. Exactly. So let's define the matrix M K K prime as equal B zero K del K prime G. This path integral is the determinant of that matrix. This proportion. Is this clear? Hey, this is a set of numbers. This, these are the zero modes. You take the inner product of this thing. There are more m of these. M of these is an n cross n matrix. Take its determinant, and that's the answer. Fine. So the net result of doing the zero mode integral over b, including the b insertions, the net result of that. Uh, is a factor of determinant of uh, B zero K del K prime G. Let's also quickly look at what you get with the C's. Okay, so when you get the C's is is uh, uh, also equally simple. Um, Remember what we had? Let's look on here the left movers. Let's see sigma i product of i. Okay? Now we're doing zero mode expansion. So tell somebody tell me what, what we're going to get. Only the zero modes. And what's the final answer going to be? Determinant of something. What is the something?
Yeah. What's different about these different insertions, different, different points? At each of different points, you pick up a particular different zero point. You know, the, so this is now again a V cross P matrix with the indices being which zero point and which point. Okay, so this is what you get. This is the result of doing the partial integral over the zero modes of C, including the contribution from the insertions. And finally, what you get in the partial integral that we looked at by doing the integral over uh, over all the other stuff. They're not zero modes. Well, that is just some overall factors because none of the insertions now depend on B and C anymore. Okay? So that's just an overall factor, you know, some determinant, this product of gamma which you can regulate in some way. Throw it out. It's gone. So the whole result of doing the ghost path integral is these two determinants. All that remains is to do the math part. Okay? So this ghost path integral, blah blah blah, one way of thinking of it is that it's just oh convenient way to derive these two determinants. Once you have these determinants, no more costs. Okay? Now this will not always be the most convenient way to calculate it. Sometimes it's easier to actually evaluate the cost part the integral than calculate the determinant. But you should remember that this is an alternate way. Okay. Now, well, well, uh, uh, we started this discussion by saying that we wanted to show that the that the measure that this integral over modulized space was invariant was invariant under field redefinition of modulized space. Now it's obvious that this is the case. Somebody can give me the other. Okay. Yeah. That's sort of, but it's simpler than that. It's easy. It's D M T times. Well, the only thing that depends on P is this thing, right? That's determinant of B K0 L K prime G. Now suppose we make some transforming, some some uh, some free grid. T is equal to T A is equal to F A of T to How does this major factor change? It's the Jacobian. Determinant of the Jacobian Jacob Jacob matrix. How does this determinant change? By the inverse of that determinant of Jacobian matrix. You see, because the, uh, this matrix picks up a product of the, of the inverse Jacobian, and then you use the fact that the determinant of products of matrices is the product of determinants. Okay? So these, this measure. With this insertion, is invariant under coordinate directions. Okay? So the question of what measure do we use on the space of moduli is not important. You can use any measure you want. You can get the same answer. Uh, I, I should say that, may, that different measures have to be related by one to one transformation. Some subtle here, in, in changing curve, measure you get an absolute value. And here you don't get that absolute value. So if the uh, if if you don't make it one to one, you run into problems. But of course you do want to make it one to one because you want your coordinates to be a faithful set of coordinates of moduli space. So if you start with a faithful set of coordinates of moduli space, it will only remain faithful if it's, if it's one to one. So that's not this. Okay. So once you have a reasonable parameterization of moduli space, you've got uh, your answer doesn't that doesn't depend. Is this here? Okay, this is our, our first, uh, our first uh, nice payoff. We've seen that uh, a possible value you might have had is not a value. Okay, great. So, so we've uh, we described, we've understood the variation under uh, on under, under change of model. I'll let you guys go and find it. Very quickly, just two, three more things. Okay, we will have to have next Friday as far as. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. So now, questions, comments, or we go on to the next one. Uh, okay. Uh, what can we do 
to directly, you know, like at, you know, like looking at the party part of the government. After we got the goals from the initiative, yeah, they did something and then we integrated the goals again. Yeah, you see, if our original procedure had been completely consistent, we were guaranteed that all these properties are true in Africa's. If we did everything correctly, we've got a sensible answer. But this is now a check on the answer. You know, there are, in the end, there are a lot of formal manipulations that go, that go on when you do this derivation. And you might, so I think a sensible approach to take is to treat all that derivation as heuristic. But check the answer for every property that is of physical importance. So that's what we do. So in some way, you know, there is a formal argument starting from our procedure that tells us it's actually true. But this is what we now we just by explicit evaluation showing that it is true. That's the spirit of what we do. No, the, I mean, you do the explicit evaluation of the party Okay, but that's a huge it sounds like a huge infinite dimensional interest. Oh, 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 uh, what, what do you what do you mean? Okay. Uh, for example, this determinants are basically party power because right. I mean, which we exponentiated into goals. Right. Okay. Yeah. But you see, what we've done here is thrown is, is thrown out the part that this is an infinite dimensional determinant. What we managed to do very nicely yeah. is separate the part that doesn't matter and the part that plays with the boundary line. So that's what we've done. Taking the party power determinant show that it does depend on the moduli in a very simple way. In a way that cancels the change of measure. Only the zero mode. Exactly. Okay, good. That's, so that's the first property we were interested in. Now, there are many other things we should check that we should check about, some of which have been running jerky, I think. Okay, so um, um, the next thing I'm just going in order of Kulchinsky, one of the things he checks. Okay. So, the next thing you might want to check is how do we know that the final answer does not depend on what fiducial metric you use you used in your in your in your construction Suppose we take uh, two different metrics that are related by wild transformations, we'll be at the same answer. Uh, this is well right. Okay. Now you might be thinking, well, 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 well. And this sounds like deja vu, we've been through this before. We went through this whole discussion of how the trace of the stress tensor and therefore the partition function and so on didn't depend on the Y factor, provided we put the critical dimensions. So it's a question. And you're completely right. If we were just doing the integral of a partition function, we know that it doesn't depend on the Y factor. But we're not just doing the integral of the partition function, we also have these various insertions. Okay? So we should make sure. We should make sure that uh, uh, that our insertions are all also wide. Okay. Now this is a very easy job. It's a very easy job because it's a uh, it's a very easy job because uh, remember that B and C were themselves wide. You remember? That when we wrote down the action, we saw that we chose the right index structure for B and C, they, they were violent entries. Now, these physical vertex operators, these physical vertex operators have definite, these insertions of V have definite wild transformation properties. Okay? They have definite wild transformation properties. Uh, in fact, the same wild transformation property as the uh, uh, as the inverse of the metric because they're one one operators. You know, how can we say that? You say conformal transformation. These, these operators are Lorentz scalars, they have no spin. They, 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 it's a conformal a conform a, a conformal transformation. Okay? Uh, a conformal transformation is some compound of a wild transformation and some diffusions. Okay? So if we understand how these things transform under, we know how, what the transformation is under conformal transformations, and we know what the transformation is under wild transformation, under different options, then we know what the transformation is under a wild transformation. Okay? But these things are essentially diffeomorphism scalars. So all of the conformal transformation properties come from wild transformations. 
And we're saying that the operators, these V operators, have to be one-to-one operators. How do we say that? We say that because we know that the corresponding state has to have L0 equals 1. And L0 bar equals 1. And under the state operator map, that maps the scaling dimension of the operators. Okay? We've also seen that these operators are primary. That's crucial. We've seen that they're primary. Therefore, their transformation under, under conformal transformations is very simple. It's just del z by del z prime to the power 1, del z tilde by del z prime tilde to the power 1. And now, if you, if you convert that to a wild transformation, it's exactly the wild transformation of an object which, well, well, like, like the inverse of the matrix. I, I've said this fast, but is it, is it clear? If somebody wants, well, maybe next, maybe we. Play, okay, what well, is this clear? Somebody wants me to go through this in more detail, we could have a little fight. I could write this in formulas next class. Maybe I should. I'll do that. I'll, I'll do that. It, but is it clear? Is, is the idea clear? There's no need ever. Let's, let's, let's say this formula. You remember when we first, when we were discussing conformal field theory long, long ago, we discussed the transformation of primary operators and the conformal transformations. Okay, and we said that if an operator has weight uh, uh, weight h h bar, then the transformation is has the bar h del z bar del z bar prime bar h bar. This is the factor. Okay, but now let's compare this to the metric. How does a metric transform? Well, yeah, uh, well, one, one, minus one, minus one, depending on, depending on your uh, dimensions, right? Okay, so the metric or the inverse of the metric, we have to get our dimension straight, would transform exactly the same way, but with a with factor one and one. Okay, so. Uh, this conformal transformation is exactly the same as a of the metric. Or oh, let me say this bit. You see, un under, under the same coordinate change, the metric transforms by a wild transformation. The metric transforms by a wild transformation, and the wild transformation factor is this, with either 1, 1, or minus 1, minus 1, which I, I get straight if we're going to make the metric. Okay? So this thing is exactly the factor of the wild transformation if the if the if the primary field under question is one one. Yes. Okay. So what we're saying is that un, now if you did it correctly, I would have to get either the inverse is correct. But if g alpha beta goes to e to the power minus minus two phi g alpha beta. Then V goes to e to the power 2 phi V. If the operator V was 1 1. You see, either, either this, it's, this was one of the two signs. You can see that in right? It's a matter of working on the signs. I assure you that this is the right, the right answer. Okay? Because of that, every insertion, uh, every insertion of, uh, of uh, square root G times V is y neutral. Dangerous, and that's the B insertion. Let, uh, let me remind you. You see, B insertion. And let's write it on B here. The B insertion was square root G, G alpha mu, G beta mu, del alpha. Uh, sorry, it was B, sorry, B alpha beta, del K, G mu. Okay. Now suppose we form a wild transformation on this. 
First, let's count weights. There are as many square root. You see, this is weight. Suppose this this transforms like into the power minus two phi. This transforms like into the two phi. This transforms like into the two phi. This transforms like into the power minus two. Okay. So this looks okay. It's all cancelling, except that this del k can act on phi. You could choose it to depend on the modulus. It shouldn't matter. You see, because the moduli are a choice of fields. You see, well, you G G here is a choice of fiducial metric. It's a choice of fiducial metric for every choice of modulus. And if you choose a different choice of fiducial metric in a modulus dependent fashion. That's okay. Your answer should depend on it. Okay, but that's actually not a problem because you see, B is traceless. So if this del k acts on this two phi, it contracts B with G, and you just get zero. Okay, so this potential problem in this insertion is also. Why invariance I'm claiming is manifest. It's manifest in the action because the stress tensor is traceless in the in the uh, critical dimension. It's manifest for C insertions because C is wide invariant. It's manifest for square root G times V because V is a one-one operator. It's manifest for, well, for this thing because the only potential problem is one. Okay, so our path of is actually completely wide invariant in the sense that if you choose different fiducial metrics. That are that that are different, different from each other by some wide transformation doesn't matter. Okay, uh, should I talk about? Okay, let's let's do it. Yes. Or should I? Uh, well, well, you guys science hospital. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, I have to, I, I I wanted to tell you about DRST invariance. Uh, also about uh, if you walk with an invariant. You know, we've got these things inserted at specific points. Okay, that's very funny. If I choose different points to insert these things on, will I get the same answer? You know, we want to prove that. We want, we, we want to prove that uh, the action that if you change the vertex operator by vertex operator